So please come out and support these great kids. Uh, and I think they're all Butte High kids, too. Um, so they will be here on August 8th. And like I said, on August 22nd is John Coons um, talking about White House Parrot Smelter. So if you need any more of these, there are some over here. If I run out here, um, hop into our lobby over there at the front desk. So with no further ado, I'm going to let Joe and... Um, Max talked to you about, and they are from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, they're going to talk to you about the ACM and what they did in Butte and Chile. I still can't say this. <laughs> so, thank you. Oh, and one more thing. Um, it's going to be up on YouTube, so if you guys um, know anybody who couldn't make it, wants to see it, you want to send it to Grandma or Grandpa or something. <laughs> the link, they're here! Awesome! 
aunts and uncles, everybody. It'll be up on YouTube. So, and away we go. And apparently it was already recording. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Max Counter. I'm a PhD candidate in geography at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I was born in Butte in 1987. So just, you know, after the pit had closed and the mines were still kind of hanging on a little bit. Uh, I grew up on this hill, always kind of taking the mines and the pit for kind of the taken for granted background of my youth. And then I was lucky to be able to run around South America a lot. And uh, because of that, I spent a little bit of time in Chile and come back to Butte and look at it with some new eyes. So that's kind of for me what this presentation is a little bit about. So, and I'm Joe Bryan. I'm an associate professor of geography at the University of Colorado. And I work with Max uh, on a whole variety of things. But uh, I grew up, I'm from Helena, and I was born uh, months after a key event that we'll be discussing here in the course of our conversation in 1973. Uh, and I, for a long time, have been coming to Butte uh, quite a bit with my stepfather, who's might show up here late. He worked for the Montana Nurses Union and, and sort of gave me a whole back tour of Butte. So people like Tony the Trader and Carl and Gamers are all sort of figures yeah. in my youth. Uh, and I had always heard about this other mine in Chile that was connected to Butte, and I was always curious about it. And so in 2016, uh, I was invited by a, a geographer colleague to go to San Pedro Atacama which is a tourist town that's fairly near Chuquicamata, to give a talk. Uh, Max and Daniela, who's here in the audience, were also invited to come and participate in a research seminar with uh, Chilean grad students. Uh, and so we both went in 2016, and my first request after accepting the invitation to give the talk was, I would really like to see Chuquicamata. Uh, and so one of our friends, uh, our colleague there, Manuel Prieto, he organized a VIP tour of the Tukikamata mine for myself and another geographer who was there. Uh, and then Max and Daniela got another tour of the mine shortly after. So a lot of the photos and pictures you see are from that trip. And I was certainly, as we'll work out through sort of in the talk, as I was going through Tukikamata, I had viewed strongly on my mind that I was really sort of captivated by all the little visual echoes and remnants you saw of Anaconda Copper Company in Butte, uh, buildings that look like buildings you would see in Butte. And that's part of what we're going to do today is so show a bunch of photos that I took, a few that Max took, in, in conjunction with photos uh, from Butte to sort of build up our story, which is really one about something that geographers do a lot, which is talk about sort of global connections and how to see, you know, one of the, one of the old canards of geography is everything is related to everything else. Uh, and I'm not, I don't fully believe that. I think that it's actually more important that when you find relationships between places to look at, like what those relationships tell us, what we can learn from those relationships. And that's kind of the basis for the story that we want to work through here with uh, time together in Chukikamata. So now I'll turn it over to Max. All right. Could you guys stand up? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that is the little green light on uh, on the it, it is a little green light is not on the top. Uh, oh, that's why we're not hearing you. And it might be on. Well, it's on now. Well, it's red now. No, it needs to be green. No, it will be warming up. It doesn't have to warm up. You just have to push it like you did. And then, is, is it green? So it turns I'm gonna, green and then it turns red. I'm going to go get batteries. We we'll project in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and just as we do start talking about it, I think it's important for Joe and I to mention that we really are standing on the shoulders of giants in talking about you in Chile. Uh, Janet Finn wrote a book called Tracing the Veins. It's published in 1994 that does talk about a lot of these issues, so we are greatly indebted to her. But without further ado, um, just to give you all a basic idea, so the Chukikamata mine is in Chile, and I know you can't really see, but it's uh, this little red dot right here. Uh, as the crow flies, it's 5,450 miles away from view. So separated by a great geographic expanse, but as we'll see kind of throughout this, um, quite connected in other ways. 
this is a uh, photos that might be somewhat familiar. Um, of course, throughout this presentation, the photos on, on your left are from view, and the ones on the right are of Chukikamata Mine in Chile. So this is an old photo of the Berkeley Pit from view, long before it was even finished excavation and before it started filling up water. And then on the on your right uh, is a contemporary photo of um, the Chukikamata Mine in Chile. Uh, as you can see, it's covered in dust, and getting great photos of it is, is, is kind of difficult. Um, this here is a current photo of, of the Chukikamata Mine uh, that I snapped in 2017. It's uh, about 2,800 feet deep. Uh, it's an ele elevation of about 9,400 feet. Uh, it's in the Atacama Desert, extremely dry, uh, sparse. Uh, and up above is a photo from 1925 that shows the, uh, what the mining camp uh, at Chukikamata looked like at the time. So you can see just like the, the incredible transformations that mining has brought on this pit. Even though it's heresy to say so in view, this is the Chukikamata mine is actually the largest open pit gold uh, copper mine in the world, although it was recently passed by another mine in Chile. Uh, but this is one of the largest uh, open pit mines of any kind in the world and also uh, has produced quite a bit more copper. Sorry to <laughs> bust the myth of the richest hill <laughs> The profits ended up in similar places. Though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, for a while, anyway. Um, and so this is just a Google Earth uh, screenshot of the Shuki Kamada Mari. Uh, it's actually a series currently of three pits. So the first pit is down here. This is the main Shuki Kamada mine. Uh, in the center, and then if you look above, there's even another uh, pit. So it's a series of three pits, but the largest one uh, is in the center. And down here in the right-hand corner, you can see what are currently the, the tailings ponds. And of course, this is a pit you all know and love. This is the Berkeley Pit uh, in Butte, with of course the Yankee Doodle tailings up above, uh, and the pit uh, down below. And these two are done on the same scale, mm -hmm. so you can see that the Tsuki mine covers quite a bit more area. Right. Oh, oh, that's, oh, yeah. So here's here's the current here's the view pit, um, and here's the series of mines in Chukikamata in Chile. So the smallest pit is essentially, I mean, at the southern stretches of view, maybe where you get on the Homestead Pass, and the largest pit, or excuse me, the, the north northern northernmost pit is well up in the. Uh, Elk Park, so you can wow. see just kind of the incredibly uh, a massive amount of land that, that, that these pits cover. And then, so kind of backing up in time a little bit, I think it's you know good to address like why is there a huge copper pit in Chile, and why is it that the Anaconda Company was the one who was responsible for most of that excavation? So here on the left is, of course, like an old historical photo of the Butte Hill and the seven stacks of the Never Sweat in, in, in the background, as well as several hoist houses and mines. And, and this currently, this is a current photo of Chukikamata in the mine. And I'm not exactly sure what this is. This is the rock, part of the ore crushing facility. Right, this is part of the contemporary uh, ore crushing facility. And so in, in this stretch of the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, um, the, the Guggenheim family out of New York uh, ended up buying small mining claims that had been staked on that on that land in 1912 and over, between 1912 and 1915 began doing industrial production of mining uh, what, in what is now Chukikamata. Then later on in 1923, the Anaconda Company buys um, this mine series of mines from the Guggenheim family in New York. And in 1923, you know, there's a series of things that made that possible. One thing we know is that in Butte, um, in the aftermath of Frank Little's murder, in the aftermath of the Anaconda Road Massacre, um, and in the continual presence of state and federal troops occupying Butte in the context of World War I, uh, labor organizing had, to a large extent, been crushed or controlled. And to a certain extent, that gave Anaconda the, the ability to expand um, into other parts of the, of the, of the world. Uh, simultaneously to that, uh, in Chile, there was a, a pro, 
uh, not necessarily a pro-labor climate as well politically. Uh, and within that context, Anaconda, even though World War I had ended, the demand for copper from World War I had gone down, Anaconda was still able to keep demand for copper high through subsidiary companies that it created, such as American Brass. Um, and this also correlates with the time in Chilean history in which um, the main engine of Chile, Chile's mining com uh, economy was transferring from nitrates to copper. So there was a series of events that essentially facilitated the Anaconda Company with its massive political and economic resources to buy this mine in Chile and begin operating uh, and uh, continuing the pit that the Guggenheims had started. So as Max said, labor obviously features uh, very prominently in both of these places. On the right, you have the uh, Union Hall from Chuki Kamada. On the left, you have what's left of the Miners Union Hall here in Butte. Uh, and labor was obviously a very big uh, piece of the story here in Butte. Uh, it's really important to draw the sort of distinctions between tunnel mining uh, and the labor dynamics that that generates. You have people down in, in tunnels, underground all day. Uh, it's not, there's environmental historians who've made a bunch of arguments about why that's actually an environment that is conducive to organizing unions and leads to uh, much more powerful strikes because of the, if the miners refuse to go down in the tunnels, that's the end of, or that, that shuts the work down fairly effectively. As we'll see, the shift towards open pit mining uh, changes the labor dynamics significantly uh, towards less labor although you're moving much larger quantities of rock and ore, uh, and that really changes the labor dynamics and, and has an important sort of environmental factor in how the labor struggles in these two places uh, take place. Uh, that said, uh, in Chuki was really a place where uh, some of the first, where sort of early efforts with open pit mining uh, took hold. It wasn't necessarily the first open pit mine, though I understand if we have a bunch of geologists in here, somebody will correct me or add the correct information at the end of the talk. But one of the keys to developing the Chuki Kamada mine was the development of a process for low-grade copper ore. Uh, that then they were allowed them to start processing all of this ore that was uh, unprofitable to get at by tunnels. And so uh, the Guggenheim family had backed this uh, between 1912 and 1915, rough, roughly, uh, bought, and eventually bought up all the little sort of surface mines that were at the Chuki Kamada site. They were also, and at this point, the, the Chuki Kamada site was sort of a lawless group of different mining camps. Uh, the Chilean army actually occupied the site until 1918, so a little, another little parallel would be as far as the sort of strong role of the army and the state and sort of keeping labor conditions under control and allowing for extractivism, uh, mining to really take shape. Uh, and Anaconda Company then went all in when they bought uh, the Chuki Kamada sign. I've read uh, uh, in a few books that Anaconda and Copper had uh, as much as $400 million invested in Chuki Kamada by 1929, by the, by the um, crash and so they really made a strong play uh, to develop this site and began the beginnings of the pit uh, curiously enough in that time you know machinery was always a big problem like how do you move this much rock uh, especially as you're moving from manual to mechanized uh, labor and one of the key sources of early machinery for the Chuki Kamada mine was actually uh, steam shovels that had been used to dig the Panama Canal in Panama. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it sort of starts telling the more of this sort of global history that Matt, Max and I are going to get into a bit more. Yeah. And just kind of one of the ways in which Chuki and Butte are really connected is in terms of union labor. And for example, during Butte's two largest strikes in 1959 and then in 1967, um, the mines in Butte shut down for a series of months. Um, and Anaconda was an essentially, essentially able to wait those strikes out because it was able to use its copper labor and reserves in, in Chile. Um, and 
So Chile and Chukamada almost took on what's called this favorite child status in some instances. And I think it is worth mentioning now, it's a point that Janet Finn makes in her book, that during the Butte strikes in 1959 and 1967, when the mines in Butte were largely ground to a halt, um, is when the Chukicamada mine in Chile actually produced the most amounts of copper it ever had. Those were its peak years. Um, I've got a note here that in 1959, you produced 70,000 tons of copper, even amidst the strike. While in Chuki, in that same year, it was 350,000 tons, so five times more copper production. So the Anaconda mine was really able to pivot between these two different labor forces. Which plays into a story that we all know pretty well. So. So most everyone knows the story of Frank Little, uh, the uh, industrial workers of the world organizer who was uh, lynched, killed here in Butte in 1917. Uh, we're coming up on the 101st anniversary of his death. I'm sure a few of you were there for the 100th anniversary, or at least read about it last year. Uh, and that was sort of, the, that happened right at the time that uh, Anaconda really went to Chile and went to a place where they didn't have to deal with strong unions, where there was not much of a, a union organized or a union movement to begin the the Chuki Kamada pit. Now, uh, this this our story is kind of bookended here by these two uh, events. Uh, on the on the right hand side is a memorial to 43 miners uh, from the miners' union that evolved in Chukicamata, who were all disappeared uh, days after the September 11, 1973 coup in which uh, Salvador Allende was killed and deposed as the president of Chile by Augusto Pinochet. And that sort of started the dictatorship in, in Chile, which went on until 1989. Uh, Allende, as many of you know, had uh, controversially nationalized the Chukicamata mine and taken it away from Butte, or from Anaconda Company. And this was a big moment uh, because in 1969, the year before uh, the Chukicamata mine was nationalized, 80% of Anaconda Copper Company's profits were coming from Chukicamata. So it was the main sort of powerhouse keeping the company uh, afloat. And over between that run from 1923 to 1970, uh, Anaconda Coffee Company had pulled something like four billion dollars worth of profits out of Juki Kamada. So it was, and, and then by that time they were also operating in some consortium with Kennecott on some of the other mines in this area. Uh, so this was an incredibly uh, profitable mine that they lost in the nationalization. Uh, Pinochet then came in and sort of crushed the labor union that had really turned this nationalized mine into a potent symbol of sort of national economy in Chile under the socialist government of Allende. And Allende was elected uh, democratically. It's one of the only places in Latin America until recently that sort of socialists have taken over a country uh, through exclusively through elections. Uh, and the coup, of course, was backed by the United States. There's a whole con controversial history there, uh, but the Nixon administration was very much involved in throwing, overthrowing Allende. Uh, Henry Kissinger sort of orchestrated a lot of the ties. And so we get these sort of two pieces of the sort of violent uh, history of labor repression, nationalization, and militarization that helped make mining uh, profitable in both of these places, that Anaconda Copper Company really benefited from, for better and for worse, in both uh, settings. And just as a kind of final comment on this photo, so again, the, the, the cross on the right is a memorial to 43 miners who were disappeared by the um, military dictatorship, I meaning their bodies were taken out into the desert, and they were never, I mean, there are still many, many people whose bodies are, are missing in the desert. Um, and there are people today who wander the Atacama Desert and, and look for remnants of their loved ones. So these are people who were disappeared. And in a certain sense, in a parallel way, the, the culpable party for Frank Little's murder, as well as Tom Manning during the Anaconda Road Massacre, the, the culpable parties, the people who committed the crimes, have in a certain sense disappeared from history because we do not know who they are to this day. 
the memorial is actually located on the site where they found the first bone fragments from one of the disappeared people. So it's out in the middle of the desert, a ways away from the mine. And so these are two uh, epitaphs in a certain sense that memorialize kind of the same violent processes that industrial mining has used at times. Frank Little's well-known epitaph of being slain by capitalist interests for organizing and inspiring his fellow men. Uh, and the, uh, the marker below, which translates to in memory of the victims of the caravan of death, which was The Caravan of Death was, uh, this is sort of a footnote to Chilean history, but was organized by the Pinochet military dictatorship short, shortly after the coup. And was basically a program to round up uh, key opponents of the coup, including these minor activists from the miners' union, uh, and disappear them. And the Caravan of Death was sort of refers both to the unmarked vehicles that would come and pick people up literally right off the street and disappear them and that was the last they were seen of. But then also the airplanes that were used uh, to oftentimes dispose of the bodies over places like the Atacama Desert where they would not be found, or in some cases over the uh, Pacific Ocean. The planes would fly out over the ocean and just dump disappeared people into the ocean. Wow. So nationalization, though, of Anaconda, a copper company's key asset in Chile, also prompted some major changes here in Montana. Uh, and that, in, in some ways, the nationalization of the Chuquicamata mine is linked to Anaconda's uh, declining political power here in Montana. Uh, and this, one of the sort of more potent symbols of this, at least according to my parents, so you can question them. If <laughs> was the uh, movement in Montana to redraft the, the Constitution here in 1972, which was re regarded as a very progressive Constitution for its time, uh, and was and included these really interesting provisions that still to this day read as very far-reaching about uh, the the importance of guaranteeing a right to a, a clean and healthful environment, uh, and requiring that all lands disturbed by mining be reclaimed. And this is something that, you know, these are obviously very controversial provisions of the, of the Montana Constitution to this day. Uh, but it's, it's interesting now, sort of adding in a bit of the Latin America stuff again, how in recent years there's been a real shift towards picking up some of these, this language not necessarily with influence from Montana, but at least echoing that language in some of the new constitutions that are being adopted in places like uh, Bolivia and Ecuador in particular in uh, Latin America, that are sort of also responding to this legacy of mining and extractivism in the region. So this is just sort of, these are, now we're going to get some more into the pictures. I'm not sure why I keep getting so much feedback. Uh, of, that sort of were resonances between these two places. On the right you have uh, tools in the machine shop uh, where they do all the maintenance on the big haul trucks at Chuki Kamada. And on the left you have uh, ranches from inside the Anselmo uh, uh, I forget what the name of the building was. But that, the, the hoist house uh, that we were able to visit the other day. Uh, in, these, in, in these images, you, you see sort of a bit of this transformation of the labor process, right? When the hoist house was really at its height, this was sending miners down underground. Uh, it required intense amounts of manual labor. And those of, some of you have probably seen uh, actual wrenches like this, but I picked one up that was on the floor, and it was about as long as my arm, and it was all I could do to hold it with one hand and try to snap a picture. Uh, on the, and and that, was, that was kind of how the machines operated. They required this kind of intense uh, design of machinery, of tools, and of sort of human strength, really, to function. Whereas now, uh, as open pit mining has really taken over, and Chuki is really the sort of uh, the perfect case of this, it's all about big machinery. Uh, it's much more mechanized. And the labor dynamics are very, very different. And then we'll talk 
a little bit later about how at Chuki they're actually shifting even towards newer forms of mining that involve drones. <coughs> Oh, under there. Okay, thank you. We'll see. That's the key. All right. So again, just uh, you know, and sort of behind the scenes, these are this is the change house at, at the Anselmo mine, the lockers with the heating elements underneath uh, to make sure that people had a warm place to change clothes, especially in the winter when they came out of the mines. And some of you can tell this story much better than I can, but you'd be wet. Uh, you'd have been underground all, all day, and you come up and it's 20 below, 30 below, that famous butte weather. Uh, it's conditions ripe for hypothermia. Uh, and sort of starting to try to figure out how to accommodate the minimal demands needed for miners so that they didn't die uh, getting <laughs> to and from work. And if, if my uh, seventh grade English teacher can believe up in, be believed up in Helena, he was from Butte, uh, he would tell us all sorts of stories about hypothermia and, and people dying on their way to work. Uh, and then on the right, obviously, are, these are the big uh, haul trucks that they use uh, in Chuki Kamada. You can see the same kind of truck uh, that as Montana Resources is now operating here at the mine. And you know the size, like the, the uh, I can't think of the word in English right now. <laughs> the, uh, the, the actual sort of bin in the back where you put the ore rock is you know the size of this room roughly uh, and the tires are seven or eight feet high uh, massive equipment just another kind of I, I was really struck by this inside the Anselmo uh, it's the, all the tools had been left just like somebody left yesterday and didn't come back for 40 odd years <laughs> uh, with a nice layer of dust on top of it. But just this kind of, you know, the, this key piece about labor and about how important labor was to the functioning of the mines and how, in some ways, the mines' long term profitability has been uh, linked very much to reducing the need for manual labor uh, as both a way of getting around the problem of unions and also increasing profitability from increasingly marginal ore bodies. So this next set of slides, um, these are satellite images. On the left is the McQueen neighborhood in Butte, um, which you can't necessarily get a sense of it from this picture, but is surrounded on all sides by the Berkeley pit. Um, it was essentially eaten by the pit. So uh, this was long before my time, but you can see the, the, the roads where the houses would have been. I mean, this was a standard suburban neighborhood that, as we all know, the residents were forced to leave um, to relocate as a result of the expansion of the Berkeley Pit. And right now we're seeing a very, very similar process happening in Chuki Kamada. On the right hand side, you can see these are the miners' houses um, when Chuki Kamada was a miner's town, but these are the debris piles, the slag piles that are literally covering, uh, eating essentially this town as we speak. Um, again, this process in Butte started in, in 1955, but uh, and by and large has ceased, but currently in Chuki Kamada, the town um, is being covered in debris as the mine continues to expand. And we've got a few more photos. Um, so this is obviously a famous photo from Walter Hinnick, the Montana Standard of the Holy Savior School in Butte, um, being covered by, by a dump truck. This is in the, in the 50s and 60s as the pit really began to expand. Um, this is a photo that I snapped from the tour bus Unfortunately, wouldn't let me get down to actually take a good photo, but um, in 2017, um, and it's the exact same process. These are these are miners' houses, um, which are being covered by debris, and this is an ongoing process. Uh, and this is just kind of a better photo to give you a sense uh, of what this is like. Um, and so, just as a little bit of background on the town of Chuki Kamada, which was a company town. Um, all of the houses, all of the recreational equipment, all of the hospitals and everything were owned and built by the Anaconda Company. Um, I believe at its height, the town had a population of about 25,000. Um, in 2008, all current residents of Chukikamata had been evacuated. The town was declared an industrial site. At that time, it had about 19,000 people, and all of the residents were forced to move. 
um, into a nearby town. It's kind of a boom town now called Kalama, about 15 kilometers away. Because they were forced to move literally because of the environmental contamination and also very quite literally because their houses um, were being covered and are being covered by um, industrial waste. And you can't necessarily see it from where you're sitting, but there's a lot of graffiti. So if you could read that, it would say Chuki Kamateños, like people from Chuki Kamada. So we are Chuki Kamateños forever. We've been living in Chuki Kamada for 40 years. So this family, mm -hmm. um, before 2008, as they were forced to relocate away from the town of Chuki Kamada, um, were able to leave um, one final message. And I understand that if you do get an archaeological license to go in and visit some of these houses, that there's poetry written on the walls. And, wow all kinds of things, kind of lamenting the loss of, of a town that meant something quite dear to most of these people. Um, this is just another photo that I snapped from the bus. This is one of the, the miners' cottages, just saying that the, the Via Lobos Vega family lived here. This was their kind of last message before they were forced to relocate. And again, all of this, this relocation, you know, in Butte, it started in 1955 with the expansion of the pit um, in Chile. Uh, it just started, or ended, I guess, in, in 2008, so a much more recent process. And similar processes, I mean, we all, of course, again, the Columbia Gardens is a little bit before my time, but for those of you who were around and were able to kind of feel some sort of attachment to that place, you know that it is no longer, it was burned and then has been consumed. Um, on the right-hand side is a uh, a Pinocchio, but again, the same thing, a, a, a piece of, of recreational equipment for children that I can only imagine that within some time will meet a similar fate to the, um, to the Columbia Gardens. And so, kind of on a larger metaphorical level, it's a visual representation of what mining production, what mining wealth can give, it can also just as easily take away. Very important. Pinocchio is actually from an amusement park that's already been buried by the waste rock piles. Um, and they pulled it out because the Chuki Kamada families uh, still go back once a year uh, for key events. Like if, when I took this picture, if you turned around, the town square was right behind me. And all the Christmas de decorations were still up because people come back to celebrate Christmas there. And they have a lot of, obviously, a lot of memories associated with this place at the same time that they know that it's, it's soon to be, big chunks of it will soon be gone. Uh, and so this Pinocchio is kind of a, a symbolic place that people go back and visit um, as part of their annual sort of treks to the, to the old Chuki Kamada. I will say that, um, I guess we have it on a later slide. One of the things that happened though with the, with the uh, condemning of Chuki Kamada as the town, that town that Anaconda Coffee Company had once called the greatest mining camp on earth, go along with the richest hill on earth, um, is that the miners union, which is one of the strongest unions still in Chile, and work, being a miner is still one of the uh, best paying jobs that you can get, sort of blue collar jobs in Chile, uh, that they, the union helped negotiate how, new housing for everyone that was forced to leave Chuki Kamada and built the sort of new houses that, I hopefully we have the picture on here, uh, in the nearby town of Kalama, which is where Codelco, the national Chilean uh, state-run copper company, has its main offices. Uh, and these are buildings that have solar water heaters on top, and they're very, they're pretty modern, and in fact, both of us had this experience of flying on the airplane from Santiago to Calama, which is like a two and a half hour flight or so, that most of the people on the, on the plane are all miners who are flying up uh, for their 10 day shift from other places in Chile. Uh, and then they'll go back and spend four days with their family in other parts of Chile, primarily in Santiago, and then do this sort of run. So it's, it's a, it's, it's hard, to, it, you can't underestimate the sort of continued importance of mining in the Chilean economy and the sort of uh, strength, really, of the union uh, around negotiating some of these things like better housing uh, and better pay. And it kind of creates one of the first sort of unsettling realizations that I had walking around Chuki Kamada, uh, which is that in some ways, even with Chuki Kamada being abandoned now, and Kalama being this sort of vibrant, very 
economically well-off town by Chilean standards. In fact, many Chileans will tell you it's the, one of the fanciest towns in Chile because of the miners. That Chile kind of comes across as looking like the first world developed country, uh, especially when you think about how things look in Butte. Now, obviously, that's like a kind of a dangerous first impression to have, but it really does sort of get you thinking about, you know, how some of these sort of standard narratives we have of like the United States is the richest country and Chile is a poorer country or a developed country are actually flipped in part by the role that these corporations and sort of mine and, and global mining, global extractive industries have played in moving around wealth around the planet. Uh, and this is sort of one of our interesting points, at least for me as a, as a geographer, is to think about how this, is, this comparison of these two sites is a really good place to think about globalization and that sort of economic globalization that we've now been talking about for two or three decades at this point and how it actually plays out in very material ways, in tangible ways, and not just sort of in abstract ways. So here on the, on the right, this is, uh, Chuki Kamada was more or less a segregated community, so that all the managers lived in housing on one side of town, workers lived on the other side of town. And this was initially uh, Anaconda Copper Company sort of main headquarters house uh, for the highest ranking Anaconda Copper Company official there. Uh, Codelco now uses it as their management offices. And then, of course, the building on the left, just about everyone knows. And I'll let Max add something about that if he wants to. Obviously, the building on the left is the Hennessy, which the fifth and sixth floors were the where the Anaconda Company had its main offices. And again, when an Anaconda Company was in Chukikamata, their main offices looked like those. And those main offices are currently or excuse me, the houses that the Anaconda officials lived in looked like those. Um, they used to, of course, in Butte, look like this. So um, <laughs> this is the John D. Ryan Mansion, who is the president of uh, Anaconda at one point, and also the, the owner of the Montana Power Company. So in, in, in both places, both Chuke, Butte and Chukikamada, um, there was segregation, of course, radical economic segregation. But in Chukikamata currently, the old Anaconda brass houses, essentially, are now the offices of the current state-owned mine. And whereas the, the offices or the houses in Butte have gone in multiple different tra tra trajectories, um, museums, uh, apartments, and houses, but kind of trying to cling on to that nostalgic past that Butte has, which we'll touch. Um, so of course, it's our, our Lady of the Rockies, uh, who kind of came up as a symbol uh, in Butte as the mines were, were really shutting down. Um, and then on the right is uh, Christ the Redeemer in, in, in Kalama, where the miners currently looks, uh, live. So in both places, you are looked upon by benevolent statues with their arms wide out, uh, kind of. I guess looking at your perilous life as a minor. <laughs> yeah. So Christ the Redeemer looks out over. This is the new uh, minor work, mine worker housing, uh, where that was negotiated by the unions for everyone that was moved from Chukikamata. And you can see, I mean, it's like pretty new cars. There's, you can see the. Uh, this is a solar hot water heater. This is obviously a very dry and hot environment, so that's a pretty effective way to heat water. But these are, this, is, this is definitely some of the nicest housing in uh, Kalama now, uh, and it looks right up at the Christ the Redeemer that we just saw in the last image. Um, the places in view that never tend to be abandoned, of course, the bars. Um, it turns out the miners drank in Chile, too, yeah. so who knew? <laughs> Uh, and you can fill in all the details. If you're right. uh, so in Chukikamada, the Anaconda Company built a soccer stadium. So this is the Estadio Anaconda, or the Anaconda Soccer Stadium. Um, it never the 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 soccer team that played in it. I understand um, it was called Cobre Loa. And the soccer team was also moved to Kalama when the city was moved. Um, they are currently, I looked this up this morning, the soccer team that used to play in here is currently seventh in the second division of Chilean soccer, so they're no big powerhouse, but they're still around. Um, and this is the, the interior of the, of the soccer stadium, so you can see the, 
the stands and the goalposts. Um, but kind of going back, I think, you know, soccer for a lot of people is what you do in your leisure time. It's about being free, it's about playing, it's about relaxing, it's about having fun. It's essentially everything that is not work. But the extent to which Chuki Kamada was a company town, even in this place that is meant to be about freedom and relaxation and play, is still owned by the company and they let you know that very obviously. This is the Anaconda Stadium. So even when you're playing stock soccer, in a certain sense, you are under the, the watchful eye of the mind. And I can't really imagine playing soccer in that desert. <laughs> so another piece of thinking about mines that's really important uh, and really struck me, these are all four photos from uh, around Tuki Kamada, mainly uh, up into the Andean Cordillera above the mine. As that mines, you know, all the attention with the mine is usually on the physical location of the mine, the pit, the gallows, the head frames, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and, but mines oftentimes operate on a much larger footprint. Uh, and you know this if you know a little bit of Montana history, and I keep learning more every day, but the way that like the Montana Power Company really, its first and best customer was